I remember in the car and driving up, and he said, you know how to curtsy, right? And I just thought it was a joke. But how do you explain that to people? The music is cheerful. It's in major key, and it's also playful. Listen to how it follows the words, so to speak. And he said, you know how to curtsy, right? And I just thought it was a joke. The music stops after the word right and her facial expression, which indicates surprise. It's a short hold your breath until release moment before the music resumes to the next frame. This is the release. This is a cue to the viewer to feel and thus empathize with this surprise, further emphasized by the shift from a medium shot to a close-up. Just because viewers are invited to sympathize with the character, it doesn't mean that they do. Whether or not they do is dependent on the clip itself. Does the viewer find it sufficiently funny or surprising like Megan? Or pre-existing opinions? What does the viewer know and think about the character beforehand? The background is empty and blurred, which turns all the attention to Megan and what she says. There's nothing else to distract us. The filmmakers are guiding our eyes and minds. The cheeky music is designed to give the image of the guardsman, an otherwise formal and serious task, a touch of humor, irony even. But how do you explain that to people? How do you explain that you bow to your grandmother? And that, and that you will need to curtsy, especially to an American. Like, that's weird. While clearly trying to make it look like they're able to talk and joke about their royal past, they also take jabs at the presumed old-fashioned or outdated nature of the institution's practices, making them sound foreign to the modern ear. The ultimate end goal with this is to make people understand why they left. In terms of cinematography, we see the prince in a medium-long shot this type of framing allows the viewer to see a lot of the surroundings. Unlike Megan's scene, the background in this scene isn't nearly as blurred, and it's full of stuff. Looking at the mise-en-scene, the overall impression is that the surroundings are homey, the colors are warm, to Harry's right there's a light, adding to the warmth. Through the windows we see natural light in form of sunshine. The depth in the frame also adds to the feeling of warmth and homeliness, creating an environment you can step into, metaphorically speaking. We see flowers in the background, adding elegance, but elegance with a somewhat rustic feel to it. The heavy part is an example of this. The two stems could have an obvious symbolic meaning. But that's beyond the scope of this video. Overall, this homey environment introduces a contrast between it and the clips that preceded it, the cold stone walls and the marching of the guardsmen. The contrast signifies that this is where Harry feels at home now. Americans will understand this. We have medieval times, dinner and tournament. It was like that. It's a way for the two to try to associate with Americans, making it sound like they aren't the only ones who find bowing or curtsying awkward. She says it was like that referring to the ironic, maybe even distorted description she's given of the situation, as if what she's talking about is an established fact. Again, it would have been much different if they were still living in the UK, but since they aren't, the fun they try to make of it take on a deeper and much more serious meaning. Like I curtsied as though I was like, Pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Megan makes a needlessly long bow. Well, not needlessly in her view, because the recurring point in all these scenes is that the royal practices are weird and outdated. So in that sense, the amount of time makes sense. Finally, it should be noted that the couple is sitting together, side by side, literally and metaphorically. The background's very blurred, which means that we should now pay close attention to them. In all scenes, Meghan and Harry talk to an interviewer, but the interviewer doesn't cut in. This stylistic technique gives authority to Meghan and Harry. It's really hard to look back on it now and go, what on earth happened?
It starts with close-ups of Harry and Meghan driving, an everyday, relatable activity, allowing the viewer to peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Close-ups bring us close to the main protagonist, in theory at least, and Meghan's posture signifies sadness or tiredness. Already, the trailer is portraying the mood that it wants us to have, the same as Harry and Meghan's mood. In terms of audio, we hear deep beats like heartbeats, signifying happened? something ominous. This is called foreshadowing, foreshadowing what's about to follow. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. This is the point in the trailer where the excuses start. Harry starts by mentioning the hierarchy as if it's new information, but the most important thing to be aware of is the ominous music over a heavy There's image a of this balcony of scene. Yeah, this is contrapuntal, heavy images, but scary music. The contrapuntal music in this instance can make it seem like the smiles and laughter are merely a facade, and that there's something bad going on behind the scenes. Notice how the sound of the camera is enhanced non-diegetically. It makes it sound like a shot. The perspective makes it look like someone sneaking up behind them and that they have no way of defending themselves, that they're easy targets. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. The ominous music continues as we see Meghan, who notably is an actress, sit in everyday clothes with a frightened look on her face. This, along with the woman's hyperbolic language, saying there was a war on Meghan to suit, no pun intended, other people's agendas, again underlines the perspective. Meghan's a victim of other people. The woman invokes the idea of agendas, and with this word, all opposition is categorized as hostile. It can't just be valid criticism. No, it has to be agendas to fit the message that the creators of this documentary wish to convey. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. These are so-called intimatization strategies. These strategies bring us close to the characters, supposedly, and are centered on the emotional outbursts of the protagonists. Stylistically, it can have a huge impact on viewers, but in terms of content, it's a cheap trick. I'm sure everyone has cried about things that they didn't feel the need to televise. It's not an argument, it's an emotional attempt to persuade the viewers about who the good guys are, according to the creators of this documentary, of course. This short clip is called Alignment. Alignment is about aligning the viewer with the protagonist, in terms of cinematography, but also in terms of sympathy. Because of the cinematography, we're literally looking at the world through Harry's eyes. Meg became this scapegoat for the palace, and so they would feed stories on her, whether they were true or not, to avoid other less favorable stories being printed. Lots of interesting things to unpack here. First of Meg all, we have voiceover over images the of the palace from the outside, symbolically underlining how Meghan and Harry felt like outsiders, or were shut out, according to them. The palace is portrayed as a distant and closed-off entity. This is in Meg contrast to the this. friend's word choice. She uses the nickname Meg, which expresses closeness and warmth. Underlining Meghan's role as protagonist in contrast to these closed-off images representing the opponent. You would just see it play out. Like a story about someone in the family would pop up for a minute and they go, we gotta make that go away. Meghan starts by using the associating you, not I, as she says. You would just see it play out. Associations designed to make it look like a person isn't alone in thinking or feeling something, even though they might be. They go, Megan uses direct speech as if she's quoting. However, did they actually say this? Did Megan even hear them talk like this? It's doubtful, not to say unlikely. It sounds like a made-up quote used to advance her goal. This would be consistent with her use of the impersonal pronoun you rather than I, because she doesn't seem to be the focalizer in this short narrative. The person experiencing things in a narrative is called the focalizer, and what they experience is called the focalized. If it's a made-up, twisted, or even inaccurate quote, it should have no place in a documentary. Also, just, just like her friend, she gets like to make it sound like there were lots of negative stories minute. about the other members of the family, but that she simply became a scapegoat for them. 
This is blame shifting to the nth degree, a way of rationalizing without having to take personal accountability for any of her specific behaviors or specific statements. Everything simply boiled down to a scapegoat narrative. When things sound too good to be true, well... Our security was being pulled, everyone in the world knew where we were. However, since she's made many different complaints, it's hard to know which one viewers are supposed to take seriously. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There were certain things that you couldn't do, but you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That might exist for other members. No, no I mean, even, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. No yeah. one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling. This is called visual proof. Documentaries seek to give the impression that they're objective and well documented. Visual proof to match the words is part of this. However, we shouldn't let the authoritative term proof fool us. Many times, frames and entire scenes are merely reconstructions or taken from different contexts. You're on a freedom flight. Here, the vlog style is designed to bring us close to Harry, just like the framing. However, do we actually empathize with Harry when he calls it a freedom flight? Or do we think that he sounds entitled and spoiled? Because implicitly, he seems to be calling the very privileged life he's had in the UK on free. To see this institutional gaslighting. It's interesting to hear them use this word, referring to when someone distorts reality and makes other people doubt their judgment and intuition. Given the many different things Harry and Meghan have blamed over the years, many viewers would think that Harry and Meghan are guilty of doing exactly that, that the use of this word is projection. These camera sounds are non-diegetic and have been enhanced to sound frightening, like shots. Symbolically, then, the sound introduces an antagonist in contrast to the protagonist victims. They were actively recruiting people to disseminate disinformation. The opposing sides portrayed as a nameless, faceless group. They're simply referred to as they and visually portrayed as inanimate objects, such as newspapers. We only hear Harry and Meghan and their supporters. It's very easy to make generalizations about a nameless, faceless group without having to deal with each specific criticism. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. This is the point where things get personal. This can't be understood as anything but an attack on William and Catherine as well. My this slightly screeching sound paraphrases brother. what Harry's Remember saying, my because Harry's talking Remember about a contrast, a divide between the two, and the sound has that same separating function. And again, the protagonist-antagonist framework is evident. Notice how we don't see a happy or homey image of William and Catherine. We only see that of Harry and Meghan looking at a pond. Doesn't seem staged to me. They just wanted to be free. They wanted to be free to love and be happy. We see more homey images and vlog style intimatization strategies as the freedom discourse is repeated. It's a risky discourse to keep repeating because it's not like the two were literal prisoners. On the contrary, they both come from privileged backgrounds. But where are you from originally? I'm born and raised here in LA. Los Angeles. Yes, I'm one of the five. You can pinch me. I'm real. See that? Oh, yes. Well, you're, are your parents in show business? My dad is a DP. Yes. I, uh, he was the lighting director. <laughs> my dad. Director of photography. <laughs> my dad. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it sound so. No, so it's all right. It's, I'm just. No, it's fine. Yeah. So uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow. I know. Also, the adverb just is used for simplification, to make it sound like what they wanted was something very simple that everyone can relate to. However, is what they want really so simple and relatable? Not when we look at the many complaints about extremely small things in Megan's interviews, not to mention her podcast. There always seems to be something wrong. I applauded that. And this is exactly what Harry and Meghan want us to do, applaud what they're doing. A statement like this is a way of guiding the viewer's mind. Notice how he says it that. in a short musical break. I applauded that. 
The reason behind a break like this is to bring full attention to the statement. As viewers, a break like this almost absorbs us before it releases us. I applauded that. Next, consistent with the verb applauded, we get the applause in form of the music finally erupting with joy. All the joy that Harry and Meghan have had to hold back, while taking jabs at the royal family, of course. They gave us a chance to create that home that we had always wanted. Notice how Meghan's almost whispering towards the end of the sentence. They gave us a chance to create that home that we had always wanted. This is called affective or emotional prosody, a pathos element used for appealing to the viewer's heart. It's used in speeches and movies as well. Notice the enhanced bright colors, the sun, the sky. This is in contrast to the frame that William was in. We don't see the sky because we don't see the building end. 